Today, rental crisis looms. Property signs for the 27th of October 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, we look at the latest rental data, which underscores the pressure that many renters are under. And we'll also examine the last gasp borderline mortgage applications that are being rushed through before APRA's tighter rules come in next week. And we'll also take a look at the comprehensive credit reporting regime and why people want it further expanded. But first, CoreLogic's latest rental report has laid bare the rapid rise in rents that are squeezing many in regional Australia. They say growth in rental rates has eased slightly, with the National Rental Index rising by 1.9% over the September quarter compared to 2.1% over the June quarter. And while they've seen some easing in rental growth, national rental rates are 8.9% higher year on year which is the highest annual growth in dwelling rents since July 2008. Rental rents are rising faster in the regions compared with the capital cities, with regional dwelling rents up 2.2% over the September quarter, and that's down from 2.7% in the previous quarter, while capital city dwelling rents increased by 1.7% over the latest quarter, but down from 1.9% over the June quarter. Regional Australia recorded an annual rate of rental growth of 12.5% in September. That's the highest annual growth result on record, with the CoreLogic Rental Index commencing from 2005. In comparison, the combined capital cities recorded annual rental growth was 7.5% over the same period, and that's the highest annual growth rate for the combined capitals since January 2009. Following an earlier surge in rents, Perth was just 0.3% higher. That was the weakest rental market over the September quarter, followed by Melbourne at 1.2% and Canberra at 1.5%. Meanwhile, the strongest quarterly rental growth was recorded in Brisbane at 2.6% and Sydney at 2.3%. Adelaide remains the cheapest capital city for rentals, with a typical dwelling rent around $440 per week which is $193 per week cheaper than the most expensive capital city rental market, which is Canberra. Melbourne is the second cheapest rental market, with a typical dwelling costing $450 per week, just $10 per week more expensive than Adelaide. And Canberra, being the most expensive rental market, has a median rent for a dwelling at $633 per week, followed by Sydney at $595 per week, Darwin at $561 per week, Hobart at $507 per week, and Brisbane at $491 per week. Of course, these are averages, and averages mask, just don't forget that. House rents have been rising at a substantially faster pace than unit rents through the COVID period to date, but the gap is narrowing as rental demand deflects towards the more affordable unit sector. National rental growth increased by 1.9% for both houses and units over the December quarter, after the previous quarter saw national house rents rising by 2.3%, compared to a lower 1.6% for units over the three months to June. Meanwhile, national rental rates have seen annual growth of 10.3% for houses and 5.2% for units over the past 12 months. The combined capitals recorded weaker quarterly rental growth when compared to the regional markets, with both capital city house and unit rents at 1.7% over the last quarter. And the combined regional market has seen quarterly rental growth of 2.2% for houses and 2.4% for units. The combined regional rental index recorded its highest rate of annual growth on record for both houses and units over the 12 months to September. Rental rates for houses rose by 12.3% annually, while unit rents rose by 13.2%. And looking at the combined capital cities over the same period, house rents increased by 9.5% annually compared to unit rents, which increased by just 3.5%. And national rental yields have been declining on a monthly basis since October 2020, with the national gross rental yield recorded at 3.9% at the end of September, 
down 12 basis points from June when it was 3.41% and 48 basis points lower than a year earlier at 3.77%. That, of course, compares the average price of purchase with the average rental return that you might get in gross terms. But of course, the more telling net rental yields, which we calculate from our surveys, continues to pressurise investors with more than half underwater in cash flow terms once unlet periods and costs such as mortgages, management fees, repairs and other costs are taken into account. In fact, in most cases, you can still get a better return from shares than property all up for now. One reason why property investors are coy at the moment. So while the recent rent rises represents good short-term news for investors, as rental yields are higher, it is creating a potential long-term problem as rising rents cause an affordability crisis in regional areas. Of course, the property sector continues to blame supply shortages. For example, Peter Kozalis, CEO of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia, said since early 2017, when APRA brought in regulations that investors had to double deposit and to pay an extra 0.5% interest, there have been fewer rental properties available. Therefore, supply has decreased and has been decreasing significantly. It wasn't very noticeable because vacancy rates were decreasing slowly and rents were increasing weekly. But since COVID, there's been a lot of shifting. People have been moving from the cities to regional areas. And so now the lack of investment properties has been blown out of proportion because there's such an influx of people into regional areas. Supply is inelastic. You can click your fingers and change demand through home builder grants or interest rates but you can't click your fingers and increase supply. Let's not forget international borders have been shut for two years. When those new migrants come back, where are they all going to live? The rental crisis could be solved via three measures, he says. The way I see it, there's a three-pronged attack. First, you need to encourage the private investors to supply more rental property, similar to the NRIS program of 10 years ago. Second, you need the government to increase housing stock. And thirdly, you would ideally have the private and public sector working together in joint venture projects to supply rental properties for low to middle income families because they're the ones who are at greatest risk. Now, there is some truth to that, but it's too simplistic as it fails to understand the influence of ultra low mortgage rates and big mortgages. The net result is both mortgage borrowers and renters are under significant financial pressures and we'll be reporting on that next week with the results from our surveys to the end of October. The structural issues need to be tackled. It isn't simply a question of supply. Now, APRA rules will change at the start of next week with brokers across the country scrambling to get borderline deals over the line before the stricter lending conditions kick in. The change in APRA regulations have left many at the margins of the home loan market in a unique position where they can get funding this week, but not next. This key market segment is vulnerable to what is known as the mortgage belt and look likely to be excluded by the tightening. The best way to think about the mortgage belt is like the belt on your trousers, explained the National Research Director at PRD Nationwide. You can tighten it or loosen it. That translates to the amount of lending that banks can approve. At the moment, with APRA increasing the serviceability assessment levels, the banks are feeling that they have limited time before they have to tighten and only a certain amount of people will pass the serviceability assessment test. The mortgage belt tightening will target those on the borderline of getting a home loan in the first place, and thus also those at biggest risk of default. At the moment, there's several categories of people who are applying. The ones who will not be able to pass the test with as little as an extra 0.5% being applied to serviceability are usually first home buyers who have a heavy reliance on government grants to be able to put together their deposit and get a home loan. They're using all their available grants to get something. Those are the ones that you would be worried about because technically you should be able to service your loans without any of those grants in the first place. Banks assess at a higher rate and if just that slight increase means that you can no longer access finance, it means that you'll be struggling if anything happened to interest rates. We're at a historically low interest rate environment, and if any of that increased, you'll be at risk of not being able to service the mortgage and have the possibility of foreclosure or sell up. It will have a heavy impact 
on your ability to live. And in a way, it does limit those who would be at risk. And that's what we've been worried about. The proportion of family income that goes on servicing mortgages is at very high levels at the moment. And with very low wages growth in Australia, that's a worry. If you talk about whether the people who can get a loan this week before the changes come in should be getting a loan, the straight answer is no, because at the end of the day, these measures are coming in to assist people as a contingency plan to avoid them getting into dire situations and not being able to meet payments. I absolutely agree with that. And unfortunately, lending standards are still too loose and many people are going to get in over their heads. And remember, interest rates will ultimately rise. It's just a question of when. And elsewhere, the Australian Finance Industry Association has called for comprehensive credit reporting to be extended to smaller specialist lenders and fintechs in order to boost competition. Comprehensive Credit Reporting, or CCR, which expanded the information banks needed to report to credit agencies about their customers' credit history, was made mandatory in February. Previously, a credit report was only required to include credit inquiries, defaults and serious infringements. But under the amended law, lenders needed to share details such as accounts open and closed dates, types of credit, credit limits, financial hardship information and up to 24 months of repayment history. The regime kicked off in July. In a submission to the ongoing parliamentary inquiry into housing affordability, the Australian Finance Industry Association has suggested expanding the categories of lenders that can contribute to and access data from the CCR scheme. The types of lenders the body has advocated to include include buy now, pay later providers and online small business lenders. To access the CCR regime, lenders must hold an Australian credit licence applicable to consumer lending and provide consumer lending data to credit bureaus and other credit providers. Small business lenders are thus excluded as they hold commercial instead of consumer data, whereas many fintechs, such as buy now, pay later providers, do not need to have ACLs due to the nature of their products. To allow smaller specialised and fintech lenders to participate in the CCR regime facilitates a more competitive environment, which in turn facilitates more customer choice, the AFIA's submission said. Access to data is important to manage credit risk, effectively to compete with mainstream institutions and to improve customer choice. Customers that use those online lending products and look for finance from other market participants, like home lenders, should benefit from a credit reporting system that facilitates exchange. Other recommendations to improve accessibility of the mortgage and housing market from the AFIA include expanding the government's home ownership schemes, including the First Home Loan Deposit Scheme, First Home Super Savings Scheme and Family Home Guarantee. And a further review of the APRA's restricted authorised deposit taking institution licence requirements in 12 months after the regulator reviewed and updated its processes and speeding up the rollout of open banking by removing barriers to entry and supporting the expansion to all financial services as soon as possible. And AFIA also recommended providing more clarity around how the regime applies to the restricted ADIs to make it easier for a smaller participant to become accredited and increase consumer awareness. And they also suggested deepening debt capital markets with them calling for changing legal and tax settings to the corporate bond market to promote debt capital raisings, including bonds for infrastructure projects and affordable housing projects. And they also suggested reviewing overseas examples of affordable housing initiatives and consulting with lenders and the National Rental Association Scheme, the NRAS, on approaches to better promoting and to scale affordable housing for both buyers and renters. And the body also called for a new national housing strategy and action plans from the federal government, including suggested reforms around land planning and housing supply. And one of the suggested changes, of course, is also to replace stamp duty with property taxes. A new national approach to affordable housing must be based on government, business and community collaboration to promote choice in and access to housing finance, drive competition and innovation and support greater financial and therefore social participation across our community, the submission stated. But the point I want to come back to is this issue of comprehensive credit reporting. 
because more and more people will find that more and more of their financial transaction data is being shared. And to some extent, people are not necessarily very clear about what information is being shared, with whom, and on what basis. And also how you can check to make sure that the information that is being shared is accurate. This is becoming increasingly important now because as more entities share data, the risk of error increases. And there is a regime that allows you to check what's on your comprehensive credit report record, and that should not cost you anything. But you have to actually go and be proactive and check it out. So generally, I say to people, it's worth doing that from time to time just to make sure that the record is accurate. Because if it is inaccurate, it could cause problems later. But this is another example of reforms being driven by the finance sector and supported by the government to the benefit of the finance sector and not necessarily to the benefit of individuals at all. But of course, that's just the name of the game. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high. Price discovery and price transparency are hard to find. And then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.